So just, I'm just going to take a quick minute before the next speech just to say hello to our online audience. Um, of course, it's fantastic to have all of you here, but we also very much wanted to be able to have a broader audience from, from far-fung places, and including people who are working on NCDs in different places of the world. So we had um, around 500 people sign up to watch online, and so far we've had some comments from Belarus, Kenya, Lebanon, Swaziland, Canada, and as far away as Greece, Sweden, and Italy. So thanks to all of you. Um, and if we haven't mentioned your country and you're watching, please send us a comment or a question so we can include you in the discussion. So for the next discussion, um, you know, in our first session, we heard a little bit about how our traditional approach in humanitarian settings is not necessarily adapted um, for NCDs. But of course, we have some good examples and evidence from another chronic, other chronic conditions, which is HIV and TB. Um, and so our next speaker, Helen, is going to um, discuss for us some of the lessons learned from HIV and TB programs. So Helen Bygrave is a um, primary care physician from the UK who describes herself as having been bitten by the HIV and MSF mm. bug many years ago. <laughs> so I describe her as a bit of a guru on um, HIV programs and MSF, so she's a good person to tell us about the lessons to learn. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I feel very honoured to be invited to this event uh, the, from the HIV department, so thanks for having me. But secretly, as Philippa said, I am a North London GP, so NCDs are kind of quite close to my heart as well. So um, I've been asked to come and talk about some of the strategies that we've been using over the last decade to help support the scale-up of antiretroviral therapy and how some of these um, ideas and strategies might be transferable to the NCD context. So where are we now? Um, globally, 17 million people on ART. It's been hailed to be one of the greatest kind of public um, health responses and successes. Um, and in terms of um, this concept of what can we uh, learn and how can we leverage the um, experience of the HIV response in terms of H uh, NCDs, <laughs> in contrast to um, the evidence, there's quite a lot of stuff that's been written about how we can link up and learn from each other. A nice piece here from the ICAP team, um, another piece from um, Botswana, um, which is one of the most successful antiretroviral therapy programs, and a meta-analysis looking at um, the elements both at the multi-sectorial uh, response that can be um, compared between HIV and NCDs down to um, programmatic strategies in the clinic. So quite a lot out there in the literature about how we can potentially learn from each other. But if I kind of come back to a nice uh, little anecdote from one of my last field trips in terms of how this is really um, you know, relating to what we're seeing on the ground. This is one of our community ART groups in Zimbabwe. Um, they go once a year to the clinic for their clinical review and they take it in turns to pick up drugs for each other every three months. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But two, when it, just chatting with them, I discover two of them have hypertension. They go every month to pick up their hypertension drugs. Quite often they're out of stock and they have to buy them out of pocket. Another one of them has diabetes and she has a four hour round trip once a month to collect her diabetes medication. So to quote one of my kind of clinical colleagues, um, I think there is a tension between how HIV services are, are, are being offered compared with NCD services. Um, he describes when I'm doing HIV care, I'm driving my Rolls Royce. When I'm doing NCD care, I'm back in my old banger. So there is a tension um, uh, around um, the systems that are being developed for HIV care versus non-communicable disease. Three points I want to kind of frame, frame my discussion around. The first one I want to say is the value of targets. Now, we've had several targets over the, over the years, five by five, 15 million by 2015. Um, and it's great to see now for NCDs that NCDs have been picked out in the, in the sustainable development goals um, with, I think it's but to reduce by one third premature mortality due to NCDs. But do these targets speak to the people on the ground? Do they speak to the healthcare workers doing <coughs> the job? In 2014, UNAIDS came with what are now the famous 90-90-90 targets. A lot of us were quite sceptical of these, and some of us are still sceptical of these. Mm -hmm. But I think what they've done is um, they talk to people at different levels. They talk to the national program managers, to district program managers, and they talk to the clinicians and the patients on the ground. 
if I go to pretty much any clinic in uh, East and sou Southern Africa, the staff know this. They are working towards the 1990-90 targets. It's clear. The other thing that these targets have done is in the first, I'd say, decade of the response, we very much have focused on putting people onto treatment, and I think quite rightly so. But I think what these targets have again have kind of pushed governments towards is to look at across the spectrum um, of the continuum of the HIV cascade, um, looking at testing, identification, so looking at that, how many people are actually being diagnosed, and what we know is that only about half people who, with HIV know their status, so there's a massive testing gap. But also yeah. looking at quality. It's no good just keeping putting people on treatment unless we know they're retained and unless we know they're responding to their treatment. So we're now having targets across that continuum of care from screening on treatment to quality outcomes. A lot of, a lot's been said. It seems to be a bit of a bone of contention. The issue of guidelines. And I, I just want to say I, I have to a huge amount of respect for the HIV department in WHO. Um, they work tirelessly. Um, and we have been really lucky to have, over the years, um, developed very evidence-based, pragmatic guidelines, initially very much focused on the when to start and the what to start. But what's come new um, in the first time in 2013 was a new chapter in the guidelines on the how to do it. So um, looking at the evidence, as, as Pablo has touched on, on kind of the service delivery guidance, how do we deliver services? And some of it, um, some of it is a question of do we, how much evidence do we need for this? What do we need a randomised controlled trial for? What can we look at programmatic data? And what, quite frankly, is common sense? Do I need a randomised controlled trial to say it's okay to give my patient three months of drugs versus one month of drugs? Or can we sit together as a collective group of experts and make that recommendation? And I love the WHO recommendations that say strong recommendation, low quality of evidence. Yeah? <laughs> the other thing is we do need this research and we do need these recommendations because I'm sorry, if you want donors no. to put money into your programs, they want evidence and they want to sh be shown that these interventions are cost effective. So if you want the Gates Foundation and Global Fund, et cetera, et cetera, to wake up to the, to the burden and needs of NCDs, we do need to work together with the research community to generate the evidence to support these recommendations. The third point for me is we are keep it very simple. Yeah, We recognize both in um, you know, stable resource constraints and settings, but even more if we're talking about delivering HIV care in Eastern DRC, in Chad, in CAR, which where we are, is, are um, providing HIV care, and ministries of health are providing HIV care, we have to keep things simple. So the things we've really looked at simplifi simplifying over the decade, or 15 years now really of uh, scaling up, is looking at the drug therapies we're using. So if we look back at the guidelines, in 2006, WHO gave ministries of health eight first-line choices that they could choose to put on the shelf. It was completely confusing. Yeah? In 2013, on review of the evidence, I'm going to say, in terms of looking at toxicity and looking at a regimen that we could use across populations, so adults, patients with TB, pregnant and breastfeeding women, we've come with a one regimen that's clearly recommended to governments buy this for everybody. So we have one adult regimen on the shelf. <coughs> we've really looked a lot and, and lobbied drug companies a lot around fixed dose combinations. Um, we've, there's evidence, and WHO has come in the 2016 guidelines with a clear recommendation on this, evidence that they support adherence. But not only do they support adherence, um, just from a very practical point of view, they simplify procurement, they simplify getting those drugs to primary healthcare settings. And if you want to scale up and decentralise, storage of this stuff is an issue. And by having fixed dose combinations, you almost halve your storage capacity, which is uh, an important, um, important logistical point. Whether this is feasible in NCDs, I, I question, and I think that potentially that is an area for further research. There's a lot of uh, conversation about polypill for prevention, but where, where are some potential gains in terms of treatment? I don't know. The other thing that we've looked at and demanded from the drug companies is heat-stable formulations. Yeah? Um, we, I remember the days of you know, the lapinavir tonavir capsules had to go in the fridge, and unfortunately for paediatrics, we're still pushing the drug companies for improved formulations. 
But I think the, the example um, from MFF Switzerland, who worked together um, with some researchers in, in <coughs> Switzerland looking at the heat stability of um, insulin, has been really, really useful to say it's okay to have insulin in a clay, cool clay pot. And that's made a big difference for patients not having to come daily to get their injections. So what can we do in terms of evidence around um, uh, current, current uh, formulations that uh, need, to need, need cold chain? We've simplified the monitoring, and again, I think this is a very pragmatic response. Um, we're very lucky now, we are moving towards viral load monitoring, but we've accepted by looking at the evidence that we're only going to do it once a year. We don't need to do this once every three months. We accepted with the regimen we're using, minimal toxicity monitoring. In all the projects I support, we don't do anything. We don't monitor creatinine for tenofovir, and we accept that small risk from a public health perspective. So again, if we're talking about using ACE inhibitors, what are we prepared to accept from a public health perspective? But we've also, and I, I say I've been involved in some interesting work over the last three years on viral load, worked very closely with the tech companies to say to them, this is not feasible. Yeah? We cannot, we're never going to scale up viral load if we rely on plasma. We cannot do it. The sample transport's too difficult. So in the space of three years, we've gone from one company who, um, that's approved to, this, this is a, a dry blood spot for viral load, uh, we've got, gone, gone from one company being able to um, have a technology that we can do that to three companies having a technology that we can now um, do viral load on dry blood spots. In our project in um, uh, Yambio in South Sudan, so um, quite unstable setting, intermittent periods of conflict, they have an HIV project which is a mobile clinic, they go out um, once a week to different assigned settings, doing test and treat, initiating people on antiretroviral therapy, and they get a viral load. They do the DBS, they put it in an envelope, send it by DHL to a lab in South Africa, and they get the result in two weeks. <coughs> the other thing is the role of potential role of point of care, and again, you have to know what you want, and you have to go to the companies and tell them what you want. We're now looking at using Gene Expert in settings like, such as CAR and uh, Eastern DRC to do viral load and early infant diagnosis, as well as TB diagnosis. And the third thing we've simplified, so we simplified the drugs, the, the monitoring, but also the way, the models of care for delivering ART. The buzzword um, in the HIV, or buzz, I don't know, buzzword, let me leave it at that, in HIV at the minute, is differentiated care, and differentiated ART, ART delivery is part of that. The idea is that when we're designing a model of, uh, of ART delivery, that we look, first of all, at these three elements. So what are the clinical needs of the patient? Do they just have HIV, or do they also have HIV and diabetes? What subpopulation do they fall into? Are they pregnant? Are they a child? Are they a part of a key population? And then what's the contextual factors? Is it stable? Is it a conflict setting? Is it urban rural? Once we've defined those elements, we then use these building blocks to develop our model of service delivery. So the when, the where, the who, and the what. And these are the questions that um, have been addressed um, by WHO in these new service delivery the new service delivery chapter of the 2016 guidelines, with very clear, clear PICO questions addressing these uh, building blocks of how we provide care. So, for example, if we look at the when, there's a recommend new recommendation to say it's okay. The outcomes are as good if you reduce the frequency of clinical and refill visits to three to six monthly. <coughs> WHO has made a recommendation that the outcomes are, are in fact, um, often uh, improved if we take uh, treatment closer to the patient's home, so to, it's to decentralise primary care, and in an, a new recommendation to further decentralise ART delivery to the community. Who's doing the job? And somebody raised this issue of, of, of human resources, which has been a massive challenge. There's no way we could have got where we are today without tar shifting. But there have been a number of studies because of this, this involves policy change within countries. And to change policy, you, that it's very difficult to do that with a number of Ministry of Health, ministers of health if you don't have the evidence. So evidence to show that tar shifting to non-physicians has resulted in um, equivalent and in some cases, again, better outcomes for patients. 
and a new recommendation that um, to, to suggest that um, re having the refills of drugs to stable patients can be done by lay cadres. So just to give a couple, a cu just a couple more examples of these models of cares that uh, models of care that MSF has been working on over the last six, seven years. These are the community ART groups I mentioned at the start. They're being taken to scale at national level in uh, Mozambique and Zimbabwe and pilot programs in a number of other countries. They're self-forming groups of people who live near each other, between four and 12 in a group, stable adults on ART, and basically they take it in turns to collect drugs for each other. So they meet every three months, usually in one of their houses or another defined, uh, another chosen community spot. And the group leader leads that group. They've had a bit of training, and they, they complete a, a checklist of, of, of questions about uh, uh, health, so um, symptoms of TB, diarrhea, et cetera. Yeah? And then every three months, they nominate one person to go and collect the drugs for each other. Yeah? And once a year, they'll go together yeah, as a group for their clinical review and their viral load. Again, what we've worked on uh, quite hard the last few years is documenting the outcomes of these models, yeah, okay? And so what, we've, what we're seeing now is uptake uh, between 20 to 45 percent of our ART cohorts where this is being offered are going into the CAGs. It's re re resulting in decreased clinic visits. Um, retention appears to be good, um, particularly once you get look past the, actually we've got retention at 48 months, which is uh, much improved compared with conventional care. And the benefits of peer support, um, in, these groups have started income generating activities, and also we're, we're working with these groups to mobilize for screening and testing. Yeah? And I think what's interesting um, in Zimbabwe, the NCD patients have seen these groups meeting and doing their thing, yeah? and they've said, hang on a minute, what about us? So in our new project in Zimbabwe, what the team is about to do is to try from the start to set up these groups for both HIV and NCD care. And that's come from the patient demand by seeing what's going on. The other thing um, we've seen uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the countries where these, we've got these groups, uh, or th this, this model of care, is that in the event of a natural disaster, actually it has enabled us to continue care. Um, in Mozambique, we, where we had periods of really severe flooding, uh, we worked with the community health workers to take ART out to the group where they would meet the group leader in a defined place, and they then distributed the drugs to the rest of the group. So again, it, it helped that uh, contingency plan um, to continue care. And also, we're starting to use these models in conflict settings. So we've got ex some examples start just starting up in DRC and CAR. I'm sorry we don't have the outcome data from those settings yet, but I hope it will come. Um, because again, there is some anecdotal evidence that it's supporting continuity of care. Just a second example, adherence clubs. Um, this, these are um, groups of 20 to 30 stable, patient, stable patients who are meeting, these, patient, these groups are meeting primarily in the facility. Um, they're led by um, usually a lay worker and they receive, they don't, instead of queuing up one by one to see the nurse to get their drug, their drugs are pre-packed, there's a general group chat and discussion and then they just pick up the, the pre-packed drugs from the uh, lay worker. Again, if we look at outcomes um, in the Western Cape in South Africa, there are now over 34,000 uh, patients receiving their care in these clubs. And 97% of club patients remained in care compared to a comparable group um, where 85% remained in care. Also, there's benefit in terms of virological outcomes. Yeah? The other important thing they did in, this, in the study in, in Western Cape is they've looked at cost, showing that this model is more cost efficient which the donors like. So but building on the model that was developed in Kailicha, what we've now done in Kibera in Kenya, um, and I, I'm sorry this wasn't picked up in your systematic <laughs> review, I don't, maybe it was. It was, all right. <laughs> um, is we've now um, tried to develop these medication adherence clubs. So again, 20 to 30 clients, they meet every three months, but we're grouping together patients with both HIV, diabetes, and hypertension. Some of them obviously have comorbidities, but with some with individual diseases as well. <coughs> they meet in the facility, usually in the afternoons, so they don't have to miss work or on a Saturday morning. 
And we've done some qualitative, qualitative and we're starting um, a more quantitative uh, analysis of the outcomes. But from the qualitative work, um, it's really quite interesting because there was a lot of fear about doing this, bringing the HIV and the NCD patients together. But the initial experience is actually quite positive. Um, there's a lot of sharing that goes on. There's a lot of cross-fertilization in terms of healthy lifestyle. The, bur the, the challenges of taking medication for life with the hypertension patient saying, oh, I've got a lot more pills to take than you. So there's a lot of useful cross-fertilization. I think maybe we shouldn't be so afraid to look at how we can do this going forward in terms of an integrated approach. The, the, other, the other thing um, in, in Kibera is that um, it is a primary healthcare setting. All the services are integrated, so a nurse can see um, somebody coming for acute diarrhea, one consultation, the next one is the HIV consultation, and the next one is an HIV patient with diabetes. And that's been a real challenge and has taken a lot of investment in terms of training and human resources to enable the, the, health, the healthcare workers in that clinic to take that integra integrated approach to care. So um, I really feel NCDs and HIV are coming together. Yeah, we're seeing more and more integrated screening strategies. If we're um, uh, seeing uh, money available for door-to-door -door testing, outreach testing, more and more people are going out and doing both HIV screening, TB screening, and taking the blood pressure. So we've got clear guidance from WHO um, that all HIV-positive patients should have their blood pressure taken and be screened for depression. And more and more, hopefully, documented examples of these integrated chronic care clinics. But I think um, the issue of setting the right targets, having evidence-based guidelines, but guidelines that then can be used in the clinic. A nurse in the clinic in Zimbabwe is not going to read the 600-page WHO guideline. Let's forget it, yeah? So we need simplified one-page field guides, whatever you want to call it, that clinicians can use on a daily basis to do the job. And it is possible, because I've done it for HIV, to put the 50-page chapter of PMTCT onto one page. It is possible. And I think if we want to make this a reality in these very challenging conflict um, humanitarian settings, this is what we need to do. And keep it simple. I just want to leave that slide up. Because for me, the combination of those two things is actually what's made it work. Patient mm -hmm. activism, yeah, and sustained donor funding. Um, I'm really pleased somebody from the NCD Alliance is here. I'm going to hear from them later on. Yeah? But an, and I think one of the biggest lessons we could learn is why don't we get the diabetic patient activists, whoever they are, together with the HIV activists? Because we've got 15 years of very good experience of how the HIV community has held healthcare workers and ministries of health accountable for delivering a quality service. So let's learn those um, uh, grassroots lessons in terms of how we can, how we can work together um, to improve the quality of NCD care. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much, Helen. Any questions of clarification for Helen? Tamam. Thank you. Uh, Helen, th that's a very, very good point. Thank you very much about the activism and people coming up. And I just want to uh, <laughs> say that it has happened. Uh, the uh, Diabetes Federation came and presented. I was on the Interagency Emergency Health Kit in 2009, right. uh, eight and nine, and they came and presented and requested that insulin, for example, sits on it, and it was rejected. Uh, it was rejected on basis that we didn't know it would survive uh, uh, without cold chain. Uh, we, we didn't know whether it would be accepted uh, in country. But it's interesting because this is a very good point. In, in HIV, at least as an outsider to HIV, it's easier because you have a single disease, incredibly yeah. high burden, and clear villains. And you don't have almost any of those in NCDs. You have a heterogeneous group of diseases, no villains and no single solution. You, know, they, you could gather people around, give me a single dose, don't be greedy as a pharmaceutical company. We don't really have that, and it's very difficult yeah. to gather people around a vague cause that affects people yeah. variably, and you don't have a concentration, yeah. which is frustrating. I think this is one of your 
biggest problems, I'm going to be honest. And I saw some dialogue, I can't remember whether it was the NCD Alliance website or the WHO website, around this issue of what you're calling it. I mean, I think it is a problem to lump. How can you talk about diabetes and breast cancer in the same breath? I, I think it's a real challenge when you're, 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 the dialogue is NCDs. Yeah? Um, so, yeah, I think that's an issue that needs to be uh, fleshed out as we, as we take the challenges of these uh, diseases going forward. Any other clarification questions? Okay, so we need to... Thanks, Helena.